So we're going to look at spontaneity in Gibbs free energy. A spontaneous reaction is any reaction that occurs without a continuous input of energy. Okay? So any reaction that if you just kind of add two things together, the reaction occurs. You can have a spark, like, hate to use it as an example, but you can use a, a, a match to light a cigarette, and then the cigarette would continue to burn. That's considered a spontaneous reaction. A spark is okay, but not a continuous input of energy. So basically a spontaneous reaction is any reaction that when you mix two things, it happens. A non-spontaneous reaction is a reaction that doesn't occur unless you keep on putting energy in it to make it happen. Okay. There's two factors involved. Okay, We've got delta H, energy, and delta S, entropy. Well, reactions that tend to need energy are obviously not going to be spontaneous. It's going to be reactions that give off energy that are spontaneous. So when delta H is negative, right, when reactions are exothermic, they tend to be spontaneous. Okay, It's not a guarantee, because it's not the only factor that matters, but they tend to be spontaneous. We said that when delta S was positive, right, all things tend towards higher energy, Okay, then these will tend to be spontaneous. If delta S is negative, it'll tend to be non-spontaneous. If delta H is positive, it'll tend to be non-spontaneous. But there's two factors involved, so what do you do with that? What if, obviously, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, it's spontaneous. If, so if delta H okay, is negative and delta S is positive, you're going to be spontaneous. But if delta H is po and positive and delta S is negative, you're guaranteed to be non-spontaneous. But what about if this is positive and this is positive, or this is negative and this is negative? We don't know, right? So this pretty cool dude came along named Gibbs. He literally made up a unit called Gibbs Free Energy, which we call delta G. And what it does is it combines the factors delta H and delta S into one equation. And by figuring out delta G, it allows you to predict whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. Okay, If delta G is negative, it is by definition spontaneous. If delta G is positive, it is by definition non-spontaneous. And what about if delta G is zero? What's somewhere between spontaneous and non-spontaneous? It means it at, it's at equilibrium. Okay. So way to go, Gibbs. Well, at the same time, there was another guy doing some work, so they came up with an equation um, individually, but at the same time, so they both get credit. It's called the Gibbs-Hemholtz equation. And the way we calculate delta G is it equals delta H minus T delta S. Okay. Your delta H is in kilojoules or kilojoules per mole, either one. And this is in Kelvin. And this has to be in, oops, sorry, in kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Right? So your Kelvins cross out, and your delta G is going to come out to be kilojoules per mole. Um, so generally speaking, you end up calculating delta H then you end up calculating delta S, and then you plug them in, and you see what you get. Well, how do you find delta H? Usually, you use the heats of formation. Okay, how do you find delta S? Usually, you use your entropies of formation. So doing a problem like this could be a little lengthy. You use your heats of formation to find delta H, and then you use your entropies of formation to find delta S, you put your temperature in Kelvin, and then you calculate delta G. If we want to predict without actually calculating, this is kind of a summary of what I started. Okay, if delta H is positive and delta S is negative, that's when there's no way it's going to occur. Okay? And if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, that means it's guaranteed to occur. So what happens if delta H is positive and delta S is positive? Well, let's look at this equation. What if I put a positive here 
and a positive here. Okay, at what point does delta G become negative? Well, it becomes negative when delta S is large. Okay, not when delta uh, when this second this piece becomes large. So when the temperature is really large, okay, higher temperatures, you'll be taking a big temperature and multiplying it by S, so you're subtracting a large number. So at high temperatures, okay, then it's going to tend to be spontaneous. The opposite, of course, is true. If delta H is negative, right, and this is negative, at higher temperatures, you're actually adding in a larger number. So at low temperatures, you're pretty much guaranteed to be non-spontaneous. Okay? Ah, I can't write. So that's just kind of a summary of like how you can predict. Okay, so then again, calculating delta G, there's a couple things you can do. You can actually do delta G of reaction is the sum of all the delta G's of formation of the products minus the sum of all the delta G of formation of the reactants. Okay. Now this works if you're given a table of delta G's. Honestly, you're usually not. Okay. Usually you have to find delta G from the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. Okay. So again, it takes a little longer because first you have to find delta H using your heats of formation. Then you have to find delta S using your entropy of formation. Okay, and remember these usually are in kilojoules per mole. And delta S is usually in joules per mole, Kelvin. So remember to change to kilojoules. Okay, that's sort of a common rookie mistake. Okay, and make sure you use Kelvin here. Another common rookie mistake. Alright, and I won't do a practice problem here because it would take forever. Um, but we'll practice them in class.